to jump into the passage. Luke chapter number seven. This is an extremely awesome story. And here's something, you know, I, I didn't talk about this too much last week, but kind of Luke, Luke chapter seven, almost the whole chapter, it tells a couple different stories. And within these stories, it's almost like this proving. It's almost like this living out. It's almost like, uh, so here's what Jesus said, and, and here is that in action, okay? So Luke chapter number six, Jesus preaches what we might call the Sermon on the Mount. Um, this same sermon is recounted in, in, in the book of Matthew, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which is very famous. It's a much more in-depth version of the sermon. But, but here in Luke chapter number six, Jesus, he presents this, this um, kingdom values. He presents, this is, you know, I, Jesus comes on the scene saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And here in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins to explain, well, what is the kingdom of heaven? And what he starts off with saying is like, it's kind of different than what we expect. The main, like his thesis statement, what he opens his sermon with is saying, blessed are the poor. Like blessed, meaning like happy, not, maybe not happy, but like joyful, like fulfilled, satisfied are those who are poor. Why? Because theirs is the kingdom of God. And he goes to kind of show, and, and something that we talked about as we looked at the Sermon on the Mount, was that, that we, we can't just live for this moment, but we live for eternity. God's kingdom is an eternal kingdom. God's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. And so we live in a physical world and we deal in a, in a moment, in this moment, but God is working for all of eternity. And so then the book of, er, then Luke kind of gives some examples of what it can look like to not live for the moment, but to work for eternity. And then last week we looked at Jesus healing a centurion's servant. And then this week we get to see one of the most miraculous things that is imaginable. And Sarah already read it. So I'm not going to spoil anything by telling you the end of the story. Jesus raises someone from the dead. There is someone who, after, at the end of this story, gets to walk around and say, hey, I used to be dead. <laughs> That's quite, quite a statement. A once dead man, right? Nowadays, we just think of like, you know, zombies, right? And walking dead, right? Or something. But no, no, no. Like, he's fully alive. Not just reanimated, but he's, he's live. He, he's alive. He's... he's uh, um, I don't know how else to explain it. He's just alive. There's a vast difference between de being dead and being alive. And before Jesus, dead. After Jesus, alive. It's one of those most beautiful, most crazy things we can think of. It, when we think of what we pray for. When we think of what our prayer requests are. How many of them are for God to bring the dead back to life? kind of getting off my introduction. I'm trying to figure out how to bring it back to the, my first point. It, it, it's, it's almost unimaginable, isn't it? What God can do, it's almost unimaginable. It's hard to comprehend. It's hard to explain. And it might actually be hard for us to hope for it too. But as we look at this, there, you know, before I get to any points that are in the bulletin, there's, there's just one thing that we have to look at. First and foremost is that Jesus has the power to bring life to that which was dead. As we look at these stories and as we look at what Jesus has done, we have to recognize time and time again that Jesus alone has the power and authority over life and death. Jesus alone has that power. As we look at this, as we look at this passage, as we look at, like Jesus even sends out his disciples. He sends out his followers. He, he gave us as followers of Jesus a commission to go and to preach the gospel, to, to baptize and to make disciples of all the nations. Like he's given us this, this command and, and he said, we'll do some amazing things and, and where he leads, he'll, he'll provide. But through all of this, we have to recognize that I'm not God. It wasn't the widow that raised her son from the dead. 
It wasn't the, the people of the town that raised this. It wasn't the doctors in the town that raised this, this son from the dead. It was Jesus. There's a lot that is within our power. There is. We have decisions. We have, we, we, we have things we can do. And we should do them as good stewards of what God has given us. But there comes a point when we come to the end of what we can do. And what we have to believe and what we have to trust in is that God is still in control. And that God still has the power over life and death. And God still has a purpose in what he is doing. I want us to use our imaginations. <clears throat> I have a vivid imagination. I've said this many times, and I don't have a clue if it's rubbing off on you guys yet, but like, we're going to just keep working on our imagination, okay? So let's just pretend today that we're disciples of Jesus Christ, okay? This, this story starts off, it says, now it happened the day after that Jesus went into a city called Nain with many of his disciples, and many of his disciples went with him in a large crowd. So, um... We don't have to change our names. We won't be one of the 12. We're not going to try to take someone else's spot, right? But let's just pretend we're part of the large crowd that is following Jesus. This large crowd, we're, we're the ones that were there that heard the whole Sermon on the Mount. And then we started following Jesus. He started going on a journey and the centurion came and we kind of took a detour. And then we didn't have to take too far of a detour because Jesus didn't even have to go see the kid to heal him, uh, right? Like the servant, I don't know if he was a kid, the servant. Uh, uh, and then, uh, but now we're back on our journey and we're following Jesus. We've heard Jesus say these things that, that we're supposed to be living for eternity, that God's kingdom uh, lasts forever, that we're supposed to be willing to, to love our enemies, to sacrifice our own interests for the, the interest of others. Like th these are the things that are running through our head and we've seen Jesus do some crazy stuff, but we're following Jesus. And now it's interesting. We've got this large crowd. I don't know how large this crowd is, but let's just assume it's at least us in here. Okay. So we're following Jesus. We're on this journey and we go to Nain. Now I've done some research. I've read some commentaries. I've done some Googling. I've uh, looked at the, he, the, the, the Greek and I've, I've tried to, to come here to tell you where Nain is. And the truth is, I don't know. <laughs> it's a no name. Like it's not a no name. It's got a name, Nain, um, which might kind of sound like no name, but like, it, it's a meaningless place. We don't know where it is. We, I mean, we've got guesses. We've got ideas. Or, hey, maybe it's right around here, you know, like it could just throw a dart at Israel and well, that's where Nain was, you know, and you know, we don't really know because it's kind of a meaningless place, which I think is a beautiful thing for those of us who live in Wyoming, that Jesus goes to meaningless places. We like being a meaningless place. Like we like being away from everyone else, right? Like you guys have all your drama over there. We'll just, we'll just stay over here. You know, like we like being off by ourselves. We're, we're here for a reason. But within that, like it is a beautiful thing that Jesus, like for no other reason that we know of came to this city. Jesus, Jesus is traveling and he goes to this place. And for all we know, this is the purpose he's here. And he comes in. Now we're following Jesus. We're a large crowd, but here's a problem. We're coming into the city and there's a bigger crowd and a louder crowd. Oh, they're so loud. There's weeping and, and there's like, it's crying and, and, and it's a procession. It's a, it's a funeral procession. How many of you like have just been driving around and then you're like, um, <laughs> uh, like you're driving around and then you, you, you get stopped by a funeral procession, right? Anyone ever done that? Like they're driving with their blinkers on, following a hearse, right? Like we're picturing it. We got our imagination. Now, <laughs> I don't know. This doesn't matter either way, but how many of you have had to like reschedule your day because you got stuck by a funeral procession? Like it just keeps going, going, going. Lots of people, right? The, the passage tells us there's a large crowd from the city that are here. 
There are people that are here for this funeral and they're weeping. Sometimes back in the good old days, they used to pay people to weep for you, right? And so I don't know if these guys were paid to weep, but like, like this, there's a large crowd and, and now there's like this juxtaposition. There's, there's this uh, interaction between the crowd that's following Jesus and this crowd that's following an empty tomb. Or not an empty tomb, uh, uh, a coffin, sorry. When you speak about Jesus, you get to think about empty tombs all the time, right? Because that's what Jesus does. But no, no, no. This is a, a filled coffin, right? And they're, so they're following. There's people following Jesus. There's people following the coffin. And Jesus comes on this scene. Here's what it says. Verse number 13, 12. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out. The only son of his mother... And she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. This is, this is a tragedy. This is terrible. Uh, this is terrible in our day and age. For, for a woman who's a widow, she's already lost her husband. Has now lost her only son. That hurts. And there's there's pain there. There's sadness. There's there's weeping. There's cause to mourn. But I want us to imagine the first century. Let's imagine what it was like to be a woman in the city of Nain, a no-name place that may not have the resources of a bigger city. And now your husband's dead. And now you're bearing your only son. And you have no, no, no provider. This is the first century. Like, what job are you able to have as a woman? How are you going to make a living? Who's going to provide for you? Is it some uncle? Is it some, is it some distant relative? I mean, this woman is literally looking at a life of paupery of begging for food for today. No owning land, no using your saving, no, no health ins or life insurance from the government. There's no hope. There's no future. There's no provision. This widow has lost everything. And Jesus looks at her. Verse number 13. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. He had compassion. See, Jesus, Jesus sees this scene, and, and we're all watching it. We're coming into the city, and we see the funeral procession, and our heart breaks, and we see them coming out. And here there's crying, and, and we recognize that this widow has lost her only son, and with that, she's lost all hope for her future. Jesus looks at this and he has compassion. Now there's some translations that will, will put the word pity. The Lord had pity on her. I really struggled with what that means. What does it mean to pity? Right? Because like, to me, pity is like, oh, how vulnerable do you guys want me to be right now? Should I use like, okay, I'll just, I'll be vulnerable. Like you guys might hate me after this, but I have a dog that's dying right now. Okay. Like, it's old, it's old age, it doesn't seem to be in pain, but it's sure not got any weight to him anymore. And like, I have pity on the dumb thing. Like, I don't really like dogs. I don't, I'm not much of a pet person, period. But like, I look at this poor, pitiful little creature and I'm just like, man, I don't know what to do for you. Like, this kind of sucks. You know, am I supposed to go shoot him? Like, I don't know. Like, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do right now. Just let him die in his sleep or like, what am I supposed to? Like, this to me is pity. This to me is pity. And so I struggle saying compassion is pity, except if you go look up the definition of pity, it means, or, or of, uh, the definition of compassion, it means to have pity. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's the same thing. But what I want us to, kind of recognizes there's a difference between the compassion that God has, the pity that God has on mankind and on this widow and the pity we have towards our dog. And sometimes the compassion that God has on, on us 
is even different than the compassion we have on others. And, and what we need to begin to recognize is when Jesus says, love your enemies, he's going to here show us what it means to actually have compassion and love for someone. It means you actually do something. It's not just a statement. It's not just a feeling. It's a compassion that leads to action. See, Jesus looks at the plight of this widow with no hope of a future. He has compassion and he does something. The first point in your bulletin is those who experience God's compassion receive God's provision. See, God doesn't just look at the plight of the widow and say, oh, that sucks and moves on. Instead, he does something. Now, we're going to use our imagination some more. Jesus, he comes on the scene. He sees what's going on. He has compassion. He's heartbroken. And he does something. But here's what he does. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh at Jesus, but it's kind of comical. Okay? Um, Jesus walks up to this grieving widow, and he's like, stop. That's what he says. He says, weep not. Stop weeping, right? Um, do not weep. Just stop it. Now, if the story ended there, that's kind of, that's kind of harsh, right? Like, can you imagine going to a funeral? Like, I've been to a handful of funerals, and, and it is not a fun thing. Like, it is a hard and heavy thing. But can you just imagine, like, you walking up to the family who's crying and just being like, just stop, guys. Like, there's a, there's a little bit of difference when Jesus tells you something and when we do it. Because see, what we see here is that Jesus tells them to stop because he's going to do something to right the problem. And if you can't right the problem, you probably shouldn't tell them to stop weeping, okay? That is not, this is not an advisement for you to go to a funeral, go to the family and just be like, ah, just stop crying, you'll be fine, right? No, but Jesus, see, he has, he has a way to take care of the problem. Jesus goes and he tells the family, stop weeping. And then he goes to a coffin, to a dead man. And he says, young man, I say to you, arise. God brings new life where once there was death. But listen, we, we all face tragedies. Jesus has the power and authority to bring hope and life to your tragedy. Now, I realize this can be really hard for some of us to hear. Because we want to rejoice. We want to be excited for the widow. Awesome. She, she, got, her, she got her son alive. And this, is, this is beautiful. It's wonderful. Sometimes we look at the story and we say, but why not me? Why did God do that for the widow? But there are thousands of young men that died while Jesus was on earth. Why didn't he raise those ones from the dead? Why this one? Why not me? Listen, I, I want to give you an answer. I, I hope you know there, there is an answer to why God allows hardship today. Why God sometimes even allows death today. But as much as I have this, I'm going to tell you the answer. You might nod and agree and be like, okay, yeah, I get that. But you're going to have to remind yourself. It, this is not just a head knowledge that you get to accept. This is something that, that it's called faith. To trust in the working of our God. Because see, here's the truth. This is, this is the message of the Sermon on the Mount. That Jesus is actively working to accomplish his purpose, which is for the good of all people for all time. I want you to hear this. Jesus is willing to sacrifice this moment for eternity. Jesus is willing to sacrifice the pleasure of the moment right now for joy and life forever. God is going to work in this moment to effect eternity. And we might begin to ask ourselves, what is God doing in this tragedy? And sometimes he may bring new life, and sometimes he may not. 
Yet what we have to remind ourselves and encourage ourselves with, encourage each other with, is the fact that God is working to bring life and joy to all people for all time. And we live in a fallen and a broken world today. And it is hard for us in this moment and in the pain and struggles of today to understand eternity. But that does not mean that Jesus is not working. And that does not mean that Jesus does not care. It does mean we have to follow him. That we have to trust the work that he's doing. That we have to see his hand in the tragedy, in the pain, that we see how he is showing his love, how he is showing his comfort, how he is bringing life through this. Jesus is always actively working. He's busy. He's not too busy for us. Like, don't, don't hear that. But he's not idle. He's working. But he's working for more than just this moment. And he's working for more than just us. It's for the good of all people for all time. This is his purpose. This is, this is literally like, here's how God is working. He loves us so much that he sent his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him won't perish. We might face a, a physical death, but our, our, our soul, our, our entire eternity will not be death. It will be an eternal life with Jesus Christ. This is the work that Jesus is working. This is his heart. Listen, Jesus has a heart for the broken. All throughout scripture, all throughout scripture, we find, listen, we don't have to look at Jesus to find out that God has a heart for the broken. He literally, when he creates a nation, he gives them laws and rules about how to take care of those that are in need. And even for, for Christians, for, for those of us who follow Jesus that aren't a part of the Jewish state, like those of us who follow Jesus, we're given a command that pure religion and undefiled is to take care of the fatherless and widows, right? Like this is like God has a heart for those that are in need and he seeks to provide for them and to care for them. And we see here in a beautiful example, Jesus looks at, at this widow with compassion and it leads him to provide for her. Just the same way that he looks at us with compassion in our brokenness and in our hurt and in our need and he provided and he is working. Secondly, I want us to recognize though that those who experience new life receive a new purpose. So if we looked at this, verse number 14 uh, then he came and touched the open coffin and those who could, carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up, began to speak. But then look at this little phrase. And Jesus and he, that's Jesus, presented him to his mother. And he presented him to his mother. Now, first of all, <clears throat> this is really, really exciting for the dead guy. Sorry, once dead guy, right? Sweet. Like, I have no idea what his experience is. I have no idea what it must have been like to be dead. I don't know. Some people say, like, they waited a couple days to bury. Sometimes they say, hey, this would have been the first day they, uh, he was dead. They buried him. I, I, I don't know. You can do a bunch of research if you care that much. But this guy's dead for some time, and now he's not dead anymore. Like, what was that like? Like, I wouldn't mind just sitting down with this guy and being like, so, what was that like, you know? But anyway, so like, it's super exciting. But here's what I want us to recognize. The son was resurrected because God had compassion on someone else on the widow. See, God gave new life. And listen, that's a good thing for us. That's awesome. God has raised us from the dead. We were once spiritually dead. We were once separated from our father, our creator, and God has brought new life. God has given new life and it's exciting and it's wonderful, but God did not raise this son for himself. God raised his son for a purpose and he took him back to his mother and now he's provided for the needs of a widow by raising someone else from the dead. 
Now Jesus isn't going to be there working and giving her a paycheck every day and making sure she's got a house over her. uh, No, 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 no. God raised a son to do that. God raised the dead for a purpose. And he takes the son and he says, here's your mother. Now take care of her. Now do your job. Now see, God has compassion, not just on us, but on the whole world around us. Man, we're sitting here wondering, God, why don't you do something? God, I've been praying for you to to bring life. I've been praying for you to provide for this. And uh, there's this need and there's this problem. and, And God's like, yeah, but I gave you new life so you could be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world today. But we're so busy living the new life that we have, dancing in our, our coffin, being so excited God gave us new life, ignoring everyone around us. No. God gave you new life. What are you doing with it? Are you, is that just for you? Are you just living for, so, okay, great, yeah, I've got peace and joy, and I have nothing to share now. No, the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount is, hey, we love our enemy because they need God. We need to share the love of God with all those that are around us. To those that are broken and hurting and in need, to the dead. We share the love of God with everyone. God has raised us and given us new life. What are you doing with it? We have a new purpose We have a new purpose. We do not live our life seeking to be full and to be rich, to be satisfied. We spend the new life God has given us sharing the love of God with all those that are around. God has given new life and he's given us a purpose. God has a compassion. You recognize the beautiful picture this is? Like, first there's death. There's nothingness. There's brokenness. And then God has compassion. And then God resurrects. He brings new life. And then he gives purpose. What is your purpose? You know, very quickly, I want to look at Three different groups of people that witnessed this. Third point here, it's super simple, right? Those who experience God's powers tell others what they have seen. And I want us to think about three different groups of people that watched this happen. Now, before I get to those three groups of people that saw this happen, I want us to think about the two that we've already talked about. The widow who received the compassion of God and then the provision of God. Okay, you think she's going to talk about that? How much does she have to remind her son? Hey, you know, God, God raised you from the dead. You should kind of be a little nicer. And, you know, you should be a little bit more thankful for what you have, you know, like, you know. And then there's the dead guy. Sorry, once dead guy. You think he's going to remember what happened? You think he's going to tell other people? There's three other groups. First of all, there's the group that was following Jesus. And here's, here's what I was, want us to kind of recognize about this. There's the, there's the disciples and the crowd that followed Jesus. And what I want us to see is because of their proximity, they got to see God do the impossible. They got to see a miracle. Some of us have never seen God do anything because we're not even following him. We're just going through our life Living for money. Living for retirement. We don't ask God to do the impossible. We don't ask God to do anything. We're missing out on seeing what God can do because we're not even following him. Can you imagine having been at the Sermon on the Mount and then everyone else went to go see this happen and you're like, I'm going to go take a nap. And then you're hearing... God raised someone from the dead and you're just like, what? No, we we can actually witness that. When we place ourselves in proximity to God and we follow him, listen, it's really hard to see what God's doing when you're stuck to a pew. We're not just followers of Jesus in here. 
We follow Jesus out there to no-name, meaningless places where God is leading. There's another group I want us to see. And that's the, the crowd from Nain. There's the weepers and the mourners, the, those that were a part of the funeral procession. To me, like this is the place I've been. I've been to funerals and, and I care and I have pity, but the truth is I'm just a bystander. There's not much I can do. I'm powerless, I'm helpless. And listen, there's comfort in showing up and, and showing love to those that are hurting and need. I'm not telling you to not do this. But what we have to recognize is that we are powerless in the face of death. As bystanders, we are powerless in the face of death. But guess what they do at the end of the story, though? They sure tell everyone, right? What does it say? A saying... Uh, they, were, they were saying a great prophet has risen up among us and God has visited his people. When we see the power of God, we can share that. And though we may be bystanders and though we may not be able to provide to, to new life and though we may not be able to fix the problems of the world, we sure can tell other people about the one that has the power and the authority over everything. And just in closing, I want us to try our imagination again and, and look at this last group of people. I want you to imagine, now, it's hard, what, what, what was this coffin, you know, maybe it's just a plank that then a, a body wrapped in cloth is laid on top of, or maybe it's like a wicker basket or something like that. But, you know, just for, for our sake, so we can imagine it really well, let's just imagine like a full-on coffin. And... This is really getting weird, but like I've used coffins now a couple times in illustrations and I kind of want to just go buy one for the church so I can bring it in here so we can all like actually think about this. We've got a coffin here and you're selected to be a pallbearer for the first time in my life this year. I was a pallbearer for my grandma, right? And so like, uh, like imagine holding on to this, like, like if it's just a plank, maybe it's up here, but like, let's just imagine we're holding on to this coffin and, and we're just going through and there's weeping and there's crying. And then there's this big giant crowd coming into the city and you're like, oh, that's weird. And we're going out of the city because, you know, we buried them in the cave out here, you know, but we're headed out there. And then this one guy comes and walks up and he, he goes up and we, we kind of just stop here. What's going on? And, and, and this guy goes up to the widow and, and he tells her to stop crying. And you're just kind of like, what's going on? And, and literally, here, let's use our imagination. Like, I don't want to take too much license, but it literally says in verse 14, then when he came and touched the open, open coffin and those who carried him stood still, like they're still holding the coffin. They didn't set this down and walk away. No, the, there's guys literally holding this coffin. We're holding a coffin. This guy comes, puts his hand on the coffin. He's like, hey, get up. And then imagine you're holding a coffin, dead weight, right? Then it starts moving and shaking because there's literally someone inside trying to stand up while you're holding a, a coffin. What? is going on. Listen, our amazement at what God can do should not be average. Not a single one of the people holding that coffin had any idea or clue or expectation that the dead person they were carrying around would get up out of that coffin. Can you imagine, like just if you were one of the pallbearers, when would you stop talking about this? When we experience the power of God, it changes our life. For some of us, it's experiencing his provision. For some of us, for all of us who follow Jesus Christ and have asked him to forgive us of our sins, we've experienced new life. And for some of us, we've been holding on and we've seen the impossible happen. And it's time we say something about it. You know, verse 16, it says this, then fear came upon all. 
guess what? When someone can raise dead people back to life, there should be a little bit of fear going on. Fear is kind of, actually, Proverbs says, it's the beginning of wisdom. And, and let me be clear. I don't think this is fear like, oh, it's just reverence. No, this is, dude, there's a dead guy getting up. Like, I don't know how many of you watch zombie movies. It, is that reverence that's in people's eyes when a dead person's walking towards it? No, that's fear. Our God has power over life and death. He's our creator. He spoke me into existence. And he has a way that is good. And yet I can reject that. I can become an enemy of the one that has power over life and death. Wow. Now I've got a decision. Maybe we should be a little bit more afraid of God. Maybe we should recognize that having power over life and death means he's way more powerful than anything I can comprehend. But not just is it afraid. It says they feared and then they glorified him. And I want you to hear today, our God who has power over life and death is a God of compassion. And he cares for us. And no, we don't always understand. The things they said, oh, maybe he's a prophet or maybe God is doing something. Man, they didn't understand. And we don't always understand. But when we recognize that our God has power over life and death, and he has compassion, then it's worth following. Our God is good, and he is loving, and he's actively working to bring the good, uh, bring life and joy to everyone who will follow him. And so we who have seen what God can do we tell everyone. We share that. I say, I say every single week, Living Hope Church exists to experience and to share a life of hope that is only found in following Jesus. This is what we, this is our calling. This is our purpose, to experience the power of God and to share it. So I ask you today, who are you in the story? Are you broken, lost, and without hope? Do you need a God that can bring salvation and hope? Are you a dead man that God has given new life? Do you have a purpose? Do you know what God's purpose is for your life? Have you seen and experienced the power of God? And who are you telling? Let me pray.